This is Peter Helland on Citizens for Community Media, and you'll see a familiar face here, Gus Zilke. Uh, the reason Gus is on is that he uh, just got back uh, from a two-week trip to Uganda, where he's been many times, and I thought you could give a report on that, and um, after he gets given us a good report here in Africa on Uganda, then we're going to try to segue into what's currently happening uh, with uh, the Catholic uh, American bishops and Pope Francis. But Gus, tell us when you went exactly. Okay, yeah, I, I was in Africa from, I, I left on October 16th and came back on uh, November 1st. So I was there for two weeks. And uh, as you mentioned, I've been to Uganda many times. Uh, since I was invited in 2003 to give a retreat to the uh, Parliament of Uganda, uh, uh, Catholic members of Parliament, and uh, I made a decision on that trip to fly, before I did the retreat, to fly north to the war uh, zone in northern Uganda, and I got to know people up there, and uh, I uh, promised that if I could come back, I would, and then I gave a retreat in the war zone during the war in 2005 to all displaced people. And they wanted to challenge the person who had, who had preached to their parliament to give a retreat to them. And the catechists, that is the religion teachers in the war zone, wanted to know about suffering. So I gave the retreat on suffering in 2005 in Gulu, uh, Uganda. And... Uh, uh, by 2007, I was able to, to travel uh, to Paimal, which is way north of Gulu. It's right near the South Sudanese border. And it's the, it's the shrine to the two martyrs that died in Paimal, uh, who were martyred for the faith in 1918. And so this year, I was privileged to go back to Paimal, uh, uh, and this time it was to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the martyrdom of these two martyrs who suffered uh, for the faith in this uh, out-of-the-way place uh, in uh, northern Uganda. And uh, the story of their suffering has great meaning. In fact, there were a hundred, close to 100,000 people there to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the, uh, the death of uh, Dowdy and Jildo, are their names. And what, they were a couple of young catechists. They were teenagers. And they had been trained in the faith, and they wanted to go share the faith with the people of Paimal, but the people of Paimal at that time were, there was a lot of political instability in Paimal during that time. Um, the instability was created in a number of ways. Uh, there were, in the north, there were uh, slave traders who were coming down into Uganda to enslave people and bring them back up through the Sudan uh, as slaves. There was also uh, against, working against the slave traders were the colonial British, and they had taken over Uganda, but, th but that part of Uganda was kind of uh, the hinterlands. It was the very edge of their protectorate. So there were groups of people that were rebelling against the uh, colonial people, and, and then there was uh, tribal differences, uh, not tribal, but clan differences between the clans living there. And so the priest in charge of the mission, the Italian who trained them in Christianity, said, are you sure you want to go? I mean, uh, that's a very, very uh, uh, difficult, dangerous, and indeed it was a chaotic situation. Why would you go? And uh, the... Uh, they said they would go because they had the support of each other and they felt the call of the Lord to go. So the priest at the Kitgo mission blessed them and said, okay, you want to go share the gospel with those people? That's fine. Then they settled there and they had their own hut near the chief's hut in Paimon 
and then certain people got certain leaders to uh, oppose them and uh, uh, at, uh, they were taken out and they were betrayed. Uh, it's like almost like Jesus. They were t uh, and uh, they were stabbed to death uh, and died there in, in October 20th, uh, 1918. So 100 years later, the 100,000 people gather to honor Doughty and Jildo. And I was part of that, that 100,000 people. Uh, I was guest there, of course, of the people that I've worked with in northern Uganda for the past 11 years because I started a project in Uganda known as the Bosco Project, which is battery-operated systems for community outreach. And what we did is we brought Internet to the displacement camps uh, that were created by the war, internally displaced persons camps. And when there was a truce, we rushed the deployment in in 2007. And during that time, uh, in 2007, uh, we deployed the Bosco Project. And then I, uh, uh, I have continued to make the effort to nurture that project along from the American side. We have a non-for-profit organization that supports the Bosco Project in Bosco, Uganda, it's called. And uh, the project here in America is called Bosco Incorporated. It's a non-for-profit. And the goal of that non-for-profit, it's run by volunteers. I'm the, uh, the lead volunteer in that group. Uh, the goal is to vet, look over the technology. Uh, it's to raise money for the project. And it's to build partnerships with other people who are interested in helping the people in northern Uganda. We started with going to six displacement camps. The, uh, tr the truce turned into a, a peace, thank God. And so it's now a rural communications project. And we have 47 locations where there's Internet in rural northern Uganda where there was no Internet. And uh, uh, we also do uh, some work in entrepreneurial training, and we're looking to do work helping with uh, uh, the question of sharing, uh, because we use solar panels uh, to power the computers. We're also looking at creative uses of solar power or hybrid power where you're using solar and and uh, 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 other generated forms of power in order to uh, uh, enable people who are off-grid uh, grow uh, uh, in their uh, capability of uh, being able to use electric power. So, and also we've done entrepreneurial training uh, with the help of some people at Notre Dame. They started what they called the uh, and uh, Accenture Corporation, uh, uh, they uh, started doing some entrepreneurial training, helping people learn how to build and plan for businesses. So Bosco ha has attracted other people, other partnerships to continue. And so as the leader of Bosco, I was honored to go for the 100th anniversary of the Martyr Shrine, and I took my pilgrimage to Pai Mall. And that is the reason I went primarily this time as a pilgrim. I also had to check on the project. But most important, I came as a pilgrim from America trying to learn more about the, uh, the, the wisdom that I could learn from these two martyrs in Africa. Okay, um, so when we were younger, <clears throat> when I was younger, yeah. first of all, the, the church that I was raised in, St. Cecilia's. Mm -hmm. I think St. Cecilia was a martyr. A lot of people went to churches. St. Babel, where you go, is not. he was not a martyr. Right. But you a lot were. of them are martyrs. Right. And Tertullian said the seed of the uh, church, or the, was it, what is it, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, right? Right. So how important is it, because you were there, to form your identity, not only in the martyrdom of Christ, but also in martyrdom 
of your locale. How important is that to strengthening your Christianity, do you think? Well, actually, if it, martyrdom is properly understood as the loving offering of a person's life, even to the point of death, because they love Jesus and they put Jesus ahead of all their other concerns, uh, it's very important, right? But, but, but the word martyr is... Uh, a witness. Yes. Yeah, martyrium means witness. So, so when, they, when they kill your witness, that's a type of a martyrdom, right? Because the witness right. is no, being the, killed. The church has always made a <clears throat> distinction between red martyrdom, which means you witness to the point of dying for what you're saying. And then there's something called like white martyrdom where you don't die, but they severely limit you. Okay. I mean, okay, kind let's... of like Athanasius was exiled for preaching the true faith, right? Oh. Athanasius against the world, that kind of thing. He was martyred as a white martyr, right? Right, but there's white martyrdom right here. Let's say uh -huh. we're, uh, we're going to put this on the local public access television, but this goes on YouTube. Right. Most people are, know it by YouTube. So YouTube censors, okay? So if they're censoring us because of the gospel, because like St. Stephen accused uh, his audience, you could say, he, he accused them of crucifying Christ, and then he was stoned to death because of what he said. And Jesus said, they hate me because I testify about them that their deeds are evil. So if you say something even on YouTube that's required by the gospel, it's, it's, it's of the essential of the gospel that you say it, and you get censored. Is, is that a type of martyrdom? I'd, I'm not going to jump to that word for it. I think it's a, perhaps I would go, it was an, it's an abuse of political power on their part as an American. I want to answer that one as an American. My view of free speech is that in almost every case, the remedy for speech you disagree with is more speech. It's not closing down the speaker. I mean, there are very unusual cases uh, where that might have to happen, but those are those should be the absolute exception. And I think I agree with those who say that those exceptions have to be figured out by the court. I mean, just like uh, they did uh, in that famous case, I believe, under Holmes, you know, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater using right. that kind of uh, thing. But it, that, that's up to the courts. But, but the Soviet... Outside the courts, outside that, uh, I'm for freedom of speech and correcting speech I disagree with, but, with more speech. But couldn't you argue that the Soviet Union had a constitution and on paper they had freedom of religion? But when the judges, when you went before the judge for sharing your faith, the well, judge didn't seem to uphold that right, did they? Well, and, and so we, we, we have to pray for those in authority that they have wisdom and that they have a sense of truth and justice. And if there's a problem, we just keep working at it, proclaiming the truth and justice. We still have the right to uh, petition our government for redress of grievances, but okay. But so I'm not. I, I I'm more confident that uh, I'm I'm not. I, there's some inconveniences here, but I'm not going to jump to say that suddenly the inconveniences are martyrdom. No. I, that's too far. No, no. Okay. What, it's a, what <laughs> Don't I'm you think? What I'm saying is, America. Yeah. His, its identity is in large part the 4th of July in 1776. We don't have martyrs, per se. The uh, Uganda, they don't have a revolutionary start like we did. Their, their identity doesn't fall back to a, a 1776 revolt. Their identity is where, would you say? Well, uh, they identify with martyrs in Uganda. That's exactly true. They're... Uh, in the South, they have a huge celebration of the 22 martyrs that died, led by Charles Lawanga, who was another catechist, uh, in the South of Uganda. And that happened in the 1880s or late 19, 1870s. I, uh, I, I'd have to get the exact time right. But Charles and his companions stood up to the, uh, the Kabaka, who was their king. And the, their king was asking them to do a number of things that were against Christian teaching, and they refused. 
You're, you're uh, talking about uh, well, uh, homosexual acts. Is that that, right? that was part of it? it was denying the faith uh, uh, in that way, and, the, and these young men had been trained in Christianity, and they said no, and he burned them to death. And that happened in southern Uganda. That's a different. That was a different period. Uh, that was in the uh, the earliest Christian times. There were both. Uh, Anglican martyrs and Catholic martyrs that in that McKay, group. McKay of Uganda, the famous. Uh, well, right. Uh, there were there, there were Anglican missionaries, and there were Catholic missionaries, and they and both their groups got martyred. McKay would have been Presbyterian. Oh, he was okay. Yeah. But the point <laughs> is that uh, uh, the uh, Anglican uh, there were Anglican martyrs and Catholic martyrs in the Uganda martyrs group. They may have been. Uh, 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 Anglican with a uh, uh, a flavor of McKay. I don't know. But, I don't know. But they about but, okay. That. We have Fourth of July. They have Martyrs Day that they celebrate every year, right? Right. They uh, the southern in southern Uganda and Ugandan Martyrs Day is June third every year. Every every year, and and they have more than a million people at their Martyrs Day celebration. And well, that, well, what is their 4th of July? How do they celebrate their, do they have a 4th of July type of uh, I'm, Independence Day? I'm, I'm, they do, but I don't think they make as much of it as they do Martyrs Day. Wow. Um, Martyrs Day is the big <laughs> civic religious celebration in Uganda, and they all come together for that. Okay, so we don't have anything like that, right, as our, in our nation? Well, I mean, I'm just trying to see what what makes Uganda unique and what we can learn from Uganda. Because you've always said we need to learn right. from Uganda. We need to learn from Africa, and then we need to learn from Uganda. And you were always going over there back and forth, trying to you know draw right. spiritual lessons. We were helping them materially, and the right. idea is they're helping us spiritually, isn't that? Well, yeah, <clears throat> that to me is a is one way to formulate what I call the Uganda blessing. The idea is that if we go to Uganda, we come away with wisdom from Africa that we didn't have before. And uh, if they come away with a few computers that they didn't have before, and we come away with wisdom from them, uh, in a way, I'd say we're getting the better of the deal. <laughs> well, do you think but the wisdom that, I, has something to do with the martyrdom thing? I mean, what, well, I mean, what, of course, <laughs> of course, the wisdom of God is always revealed in the cross, right? Like Saint Paul said, that if you want the power and wisdom of God, you you have to look to Christ crucified, to Christ the martyr with a capital M. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you think that applies? How would you? How, how do? What do you? How do you take that in a and make it? You know, in flesh it yeah. in the history of Uganda. Well, and how do you how do you think America? What can America do with that? You're well, coming back. How can you? Okay, and you're going to now preach to Americans. You were over there preaching to the parliament, preaching in northern Uganda. You're going to come back now. Preach to us. Okay. Tell us. Well, I I didn't actually set this up as a preaching opportunity. I really wanted to. But give kind us some of, message. Give us I some wanna, message that people can... I want to <coughs> dialogue. Well, okay, some message. Well, let, let's go back to Doughty and Jildo, okay. these two young catechists who really willingly and clearly risk their lives to go to tell these people about the gospel. So they settle in, and uh, they start preaching to the kids. Largely, they're preaching to the kids uh, because they're younger themselves. And uh, eventually, uh, the, there's a, 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 a like a conspiracy against them, and uh, they're killed. And um, what does this all mean? Okay, well, the fact is that they were willing to put it all on the line for their faith, and it's that kind of willingness to witness to the truths of faith in the face of people who want to deny it uh, and, and to do that courageously that should inspire us to wake up and fight the, the malaise and the despair of our first world conditions 
um, that keep us from having vital faith. And there's a lot of tumult right now in the church. And there's a lot of misunderstandings and there's a lot of, like, I'd say factions within the church. There's people, there's people debating things and fighting about different ways to handle pastoral problems, for example. And uh, nobody, uh, people don't see a clear way through. And some people are really giving up because they're questing. In my view, they're, the, a lot of times people are giving up because they can't find what the core certainty of their faith is. And the martyrs help us with that. Well, how about, they how about, focus us in. How about it only, uh, the proverb, only by pride cometh contention or cometh strife. Only by pride cometh strife. Martyrdom okay. is the, kind of the opposite of pride, right? Right. No, no, martyrdom is a humility to stay uh, faithful to the truth uh, regardless of the conditions, yeah. Well, I'm saying uh, in 1776, we could have take, the nation could have taken the path of humility and martyrdom, but we decided to take a different path of rebellion. And, well, and it seems like that's always a choice for people. Yeah, and of course that's that, that's an ambiguous um, um, example. Uh, I mean, there's ambiguity. I, wouldn't you be able to argue that there were good people on both sides of the American Revolution? Good, good. I mean, uh, there was. You could say there was good Nazis. I mean, I mean, well, using not in the word Nazi in a, you know its normal t- normal understanding. Okay, but. Uh, I mean, I mean, good people end up in hell in a sense. I mean, you could say that well, person's that's a good your, person. That, no, okay. I'm just saying, but if you're wrong on, on what God says is right and wrong, even though you may be considered a good person. Um, right, but you can be in error and you can still cooperate with people in error to promote peace. That's exactly the teaching of the Catholic Church. It was very clearly articulated by Pope John the Twenty Third in his document Pacem and Terras. But Jesus said, "I didn't come to bring peace, but division." So the saving of your soul is more important than than peace. Sometimes, uh, no. The goal of saving your soul is to bestow the peace of Christ on the whole world. Right, but there's so, peace, so, uh, peace when there is no peace. There's well, a, there's of course, uh, th- th- yeah, no, you could have false peace mm-hmm. or a false sense of what peace really is mm-hmm. or, or, or even an imperfect peace. Like you could have peace that was established by force like uh, Pope John the Twenty Third talks about. Well, you could have peace by you, saying, you, just don't mention Jesus here and then we'll have peace. Well, peace um, without Jesus is a phony peace. When, isn't that the Christian position? Uh, when, when Jesus himself is compromised, where he's not allowed to be at the table, but you got peace. Uh, that, 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 it depends on what conditions we're talking about. But yeah, I, I want freedom for Jesus, of course. Mm-hmm. And so does the church. I mean, St. Paul no, said, I, was not, I, 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 was, I didn't shun from proclaiming you the whole gospel. Right. Which meant and, every sin that needed to be condemned, he condemned it. Well, right, but uh, there's a hierarchy of concerns uh, in how we we promote the truth too. I and what I mean by that is, uh, like when Kennedy and Khrushchev were in their private um, correspondence that no one knew about at the time, or very few people knew about it, and uh, 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 Khrushchev wrote him back and said. You know, we're all on this ark together. But, and indeed, both the clean and the unclean animals were allowed on the ark. And, I th- and Kennedy wrote back, he says, I really like that, uh, uh, what you said about the ark. So they, they, their first point of agreement was that they could have all kinds of moral disagreements when, when Khrushchev said the clean and the unclean, you know, it was because uh, obviously there was a huge debate in the world at that time about how uh, economics was to be conducted, right? Mm-hmm. And there were the clean and the unclean. 
Capitalism versus communism? Right. It could be capitalism versus communism, to simplify it that way. Uh, and the, But for Khrushchev, finally, in his uh, dialogue with Kennedy, he said, well, but we got to all be on this ark together, and we dare not destroy the ark. And it seems to me that, that that's a teaching there that's very important here to the moral problems we're looking at. Well, let's go back. Let's go. Yeah. The Catholic Church was started in the sense that when the Roman Empire was falling apart, the Catholic Church kind of had to carry a burden that it wasn't necessarily instituted for, right? Uh, right. And that's that, a, that, yeah, that, there's, uh, there's a whole historical problem of what we call the Constantinian Church. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so in, in a sense, it, it, they still feel a burden to be... Uh, Workers for world peace, right? And and to do it the way uh, in, to do it in wise ways, uh, of course. That's a that's the uh, uh, that's the part of the vocation, especially of the papacy. Okay, the the uh, in the twentieth, the late nineteenth, and the twentieth century, the popes always saw their job as being concerned with world peace right. as but, one but of their know, big jobs. But America was founded basically by the, on the Westminster Confession right. or the Savoy or the, uh, the London, the Baptist London Confession, which were almost all the same. Right. And at Westminster, I know, the, the Pope was the Antichrist. Okay. Right. And so they would definitely say, well, this move for peace is obvious. It's the false peace. You okay. Know, right. I mean, that's that's what you're up against all the time. I, I, I'm a, I know I'm up against it, but I also have history in the mid part of the 20th century on my side. I mean, it, 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 there wouldn't have been. I mean, Pope John the 23rd was instrumental in negotiating uh, the problem between Khrushchev and Kennedy. He helped, mm -hmm. and I don't care what uh, out of the way American who's clinging to their Westminster confession, wants to say about the, um, uh, about the Pope being the Antichrist, um, it would seem to me that we're all breathing and living today because Kennedy and Khrushchev didn't go over the uh, brink in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that was aided by the work of uh, the Pope. So... This idea that we're just going to throw the Pope under the bus because of some uh, scruple we have about our faith, not a good idea. Well, blessed, not a good blessed, idea. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Right. They shall be called sons, sons of, God. of God. Right. So in a sense, you really can't claim you're a son of God unless you're a peacemaker, isn't there? Yeah, no, it, building and building peace is very, very difficult. And it, it's true that it, that, that it could be misunderstood. And, it, and in many situations, uh, the Catholic Church has been misunderstood. I'm familiar with a, lots of the misunderstandings. I've got lots of friends who, well, I've got lots of friends who've left the Catholic Church. And there's more leaving right now because of the current uh, crisis. And well, they, they probably feel that the Pope is pursuing peace at the expense of truth. Is that possible? Uh, there are some who feel that way. And I'd like to challenge them to, to look at the whole conditions of that again um, uh, and communicate more. Uh, well, let, let's have a serene dialogue about that. I mean, I'm suggesting when I say serene dialogue... I'm suggesting that people step back and look at the whole historical vocation of the papacy and think about John the 23rd again with Kennedy and Khrushchev. Think about Khrushchev saying the thing about clean and unclean in the ark. Well, let me, let me, let me, and, uh, and let me suggest that there are times that you have to, you have to go for uh, um, peace in situations where uh, 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 you have to find the truth about peace in the heart of your own enemy.
Okay, that and that's that's the Gandhi insight. Well, I, I met uh, yeah. Archbishop Obama, right? Right, you met Archbishop Obama, who's the Archbishop of Gulu yes. in U northern Uganda. Okay, so a lot of people are complaining about the Catholic leadership in America, let's say especially maybe. Right. You you are very fairly intimate with some of the, the Catholic leadership in Uganda, right? Yeah. Was there anything we can learn from them? I mean, the way they saw things, there was anything that you would say, yeah, I, I think that was a good quality that maybe we are not so strong in, or, or you don't want to go there. I mean, well, no, I no, I think you, uh, you're you hitting on something that uh, might be worth uh, telling a story about. With Archbishop Odama, he chose at the, at the point in the war to risk his life and go meet the rebels unarmed, just in his archbishop uh, uh, clothes, which in in, uh, in Uganda, an archbishop, when he's in his official clothes, he's it's it's white and he's got the cap and you know uh, not like he's ready for liturgy, but he has these official bishops' clothes. Uh, and of course, in America, we don't we uh, uh, a lot of people don't dress up that much but in in Africa they do and he was in and he goes out to the wilderness uh unarmed and meets with the rebel leaders and starts out the conversation with this line kill me if you must but i tell you if you do kill me you'll be killing your own father i come as your father and they understood the import of that, and well, they didn't tell, kill him. Uh, tell the uh, <clears throat> people that may be watching what the rebels were about. Well, the rebels were uh, involved in an insurgency against the government of Uganda, and they were fighting the government's army, which was, uh, uh, and they were, uh, you know, that it was a very, very messy war of insurgency but they were going into the villages and, and snatching up the young boys they were they were kidnapping stealing children. Them from their fathers yeah they were kidnapping children and uh um pressing them to service in their turning them into monsters the best as they in, could into their uh, into their army dad that's absolutely right they were doing things against their own people like that and yet uh, somebody had to open the negotiations between them and the government. So why do you think they decided not to kill him? Good question. And I mean, uh, probably because it was discerned that, uh, that this fight just couldn't go on forever. And they thought he was genuine? Oh, they absolutely, everyone knew he was genuine. That was... He was genuine. He had no ulterior motives except to bring the peace of Christ. Well, yeah. And that that makes all the difference. Well, you remember I wanted you to ask him that theological question? Yeah, I don't get to those with him because uh, uh, we're busy discussing things that are a little more uh, at hand than the latest theological question from Peter Allen. Sorry, Peter. But the, but the thing is, is that on, on, maybe the next time I see him or the next time he's in the United States, you can ask him your theological questions. Well, from my experience, he's the one that would be interested in that question. Well, I, let's leave your theological questions in parentheses and continue on with the question you raised about why is the, uh, uh, what do the African people and their clergy have to teach us okay that's a good question let's stay there right now i think that what the experience of my experience in northern uganda has taught me is that the faith can actually impel us to change the world that people didn't know that that, uh, that war could be ended. And Odama, with other people, working with other people, 
working with all manner of people, he helped end that war. And um, what that does is it gives us hope that we can, uh, we can end some of the uh, potential wars or the wars that are, are, are with us. Yeah, but you're using the same terminology that, let's say, President Obama used because his, his idea was change and hope. And you're saying the same thing. I, I can't, oh, I can't not, well, believe the content here is exactly the same. Well, <laughs> let's just say that a person can have a political ideal and they either are able to back it up or they end up doing, uh, because they're forced to, actions that are against that political ideal. And uh, let's just leave uh, the question of, I don't believe that I'm just echoing uh, the, uh, uh, any sort of ideological American nostrum when, uh, uh, when I say that uh, Archbishop Obama and the people in northern Uganda actually had faith in God and they acted on that faith to build peace where there wasn't peace before. But their ultimate goal has changed is, is that he wants them ultimately to repent and accept Jesus Christ as their, as their, um, as their Lord. I mean, isn't that kind of what he's ultimately hoping? Even though I think the, the, the head of the Lord's army would have said he was a Christian, right? Or what would he have said? Well, uh, well yeah, actually, the, uh, uh, they, they would make, the, uh, they, they'd make arguments that they're uh, uh, trying to f follow God, but um, obviously uh, they were not following God if they were uh, kidnapping children and things like that. Right. In other words, the end... The does end not does, justify the means, and that's a Christian principle. Yeah, the end doesn't justify the means, and yet um, it, once once you've got a whole bunch of your children that have been drafted into the uh, rebel army, uh, and so they're all mixed together now, the clean and the unclean. What do you do? Do you just do you just perpetuate the war? Or do you work on a, a program to build peace? Well, the people in northern Uganda realized, and their big leader was Archbishop Odama, that they had to build peace if they wanted to even get some of their children reconciled back. Well, how about, I mean, they said they had a poll several months ago that 30-some percent of Americans believe that we're going to have a civil war. Okay, well, we're already in one right now, okay, because Thanksgiving's going to come up, and probably at most tables, somebody doesn't really want to talk to somebody because that person is Democrat and the other one's Republican or some issue. And so it is getting really uh, more and more intense. Right. So definitely what, you, what they went through could, maybe there's something to apply here because now we really need to be reconcilers, Right. Right. <clears throat> yes. Um, indeed, one of my favorite uh, lines, I mean, and, and uh, this requires some thinking so people can ponder it historically, but I have Archbishop Odama and Thomas Paine arguing inside my soul because I'm an American. Thomas Paine in his book Common Sense says there's no reconcilement, right? When, when hatred, he quotes uh, Satan in Paradise Lost and it's something to that. When, when hatred gets this intense, reconciliation is impossible. Right. And that's a quote, He's, paraphrase out of... Uh, out of Milton? Yeah. Okay. So the, so the thing is, is that, uh, and for Archbishop Obama, um, redemption can occur and reconciliation can occur and it can be a miracle, but it can still occur. And so if we're honest about our current condition of our souls, we should be in touch with both sides. We should be in touch with the, with the Christian uh, aspect calling us to further forgive and reconcile. We should also be in touch with the residue of our American experience that 
that pulls us in the other direction. And we should know that there's this pull going on uh, in all our political discourse. And it seems to me that the, the solution to our problem is, is to go into the, to go where the people we most disagree with and discover the truth that they have for us. But, you, but you, the reason you do that is probably you're uh, imitating your dad because you, would, you used to say he'd walk around the house because <clears throat> uh, he was raised Lutheran or Lutheran grandfather like mine, okay? And Luther uh, didn't like the book of James even to the point that he, you know, took it out maybe. And uh, so what, was your, what were the two phrases? Your, one was, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Right. Versus you faith see alone. <clears throat> he, he used to say, faith alone is necessary for salvation. Faith without works is dead. And he used to, he used to say those two together. And he allowed the dialogue to go on in his soul. Yeah. Well, I, I figure that I got to allow the dialogue between uh, Thomas Paine and Archbishop Odama to go on in my soul. I'm really hoping that Archbishop Odama wins, but I'm not being presumptuous about that. I, I can actually see the Thomas Paine side of my American experience. But obviously America is more infected with the Thomas Paine thinking than Uganda, right? Well, yeah, but but you got historically, being, but you got is being tempted to go that route, wouldn't you say? Um, or what, what did you know? What, what is the challenge of Uganda? Is it they're being tempted to to uh, give ear to the ideology? Well, sure, of I, Americanism or Thomas Paine, however you well, want to say it. Well, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of challenges uh, to to the right way to go about helping Africa. Okay. And the way we formulate it is that you have to connect people and preserve culture. That's our tagline for Bosco. Connect people and preserve culture. So I started a project with the Internet designed to do that. I also think that uh, uh, we need grace uh, from the church helping us and wisdom. And that's where Pope Francis comes in. Right. You were gonna, uh, uh, yeah, I was going to at that. least make a point here about the need to respect the role of the Pope even when we disagree with certain things that might have happened um, because we still need a Pope. And I think lately we've had these controversies and I want to I wanna at least address one of the most uh, significant ones, which was that this Archbishop Vigano argued uh, in his first letter that the Pope should resign. And I think when he said that, he shut down the dialogue that could have occurred on all the other things he said in his letter. So because if I, if I disagree with you, Peter, just what you said before about the problem with YouTube in certain situations, if, if I disagree with you and make my disagreement that you should just be shut down, that you should just resign, that you should just leave, then your response to my position is going to be much more difficult to carry on. Whereas if, if I disagree with you in a, uh, without saying that you should be totally shut down, then there's, there's room for discussion. And what we're, what we're seeing is that a lot of people just want to shut down their opponents and not give any room for discussion. I'm pleading with people to look to the American wisdom about the First Amendment and the wisdom of our better legal scholars who would say that the solution to speech you disagree with is more speech. Well, where do you think Jesus grew up in? Of course, this is my, you know, my mantra is yeah, Jesus, it, Jesus in the temple at age 12, and he's in there for... Um, okay. He's in there for three days right? with no indication he was going to leave on the fourth day if right. his mom hadn't came. So, <laughs> but right. this under, is exactly understanding Jewish dialogue, it could have been intense. Oh, I'm sure it was. But they didn't just excommunicate you because you had a different viewpoint. No, they allowed the discussion to go on. And that, that of course, is the exact uh, uh, point that I wanted to make about... 
about that. And indeed, my friend John Dunn has, has a, uh, a really beautiful uh, image of this. He calls it <coughs> passing over. And of course, my friend uh, Joe Bajakis, the theologian, says that passing over is dialogue on steroids. And of course, I, I like that because what we really do need to have dialogue on steroids right now in the church and in the world. If we don't, we're finished. I mean, so my recommendation to people who are worried about the people and their families that disagree with them on Thanksgiving is come on, let go and talk to them. Hear them out, no matter what their position is. Yeah, but one side may believe that God has never spoken, never revealed himself, and then the other side believes, no, he's revealed himself in the scriptures all throughout. So isn't that a divide that's almost impossible to bridge? Well, not for John Donne. Okay. It wasn't. When he says here, he says, when I do pass over to another person, I do not straight away come to see the other in a new light. I come rather to see what the other sees and feel what the other feels. That's what passing over is. Entering into the standpoint of another, seeing with another's eyes, feeling with another's heart. It's like going from the northern to the southern hemisphere and seeing the stars in a new constellation in the night sky. There are stars that can be seen only in the northern sky as the North Star itself and the constellations of the Big and Little Dipper. And then there are those that can be seen only in the southern sky as in the constellation of the Southern Cross. And then there are those that can be seen in both as the constellation of Orion and the Hunter. Thus, when I travel to the southern hemisphere, I come to see stars and constellations I have never seen before, although I see also the continuity and the overlap of the northern and southern sky. So, too, when I pass over, this is very important, when I pass over into another's life, I see events and patterns of events I have never seen before. Although I see a continuity and an overlap of my life and, uh, and the others, I come by traveling to see the whole sky over time and all the stars that are visible to the naked eye. So, too, I come by passing over to see human existence as a whole and all the things that belong to a human life. That is wisdom. That is it is a is a is a formula for dealing with reality and without that wisdom uh operative uh we're going to be sunk now let me uh go back to pat pope francis for just a minute uh uh please uh i'm making an appeal to today uh if people want to challenge me on this feel free to email me at my own email address, and they're going to run it up on the on the screen at some point at toward, at this show ends. But um, what I want to say about Francis is that this Archbishop Vigano said he should resign at the end of his like near the end of his first letter, and that then Francis answered that by saying, "I'm going to be silent on this." And what I saw a lot of Americans do in the Catholic media, I saw personal friends of mine uh, uh, say these things in public against the Pope. It just grieves me because they don't understand. First of all, Francis was not saying that we're, not, we're to be silent about the injustices and abuses in the church by the clerics. He's, he's fought the clerics. Read him. He's talked about the problem of clericalism, and he's talked about the problem of abuse. But but and he was but he was saying that in light of the fact that somebody lunged after his whole office and said that he should resign, he will be silent about that. And and it just seems to me Americans have just gotten out the pitchforks against Francis unjustly rashly so rash judgment and um, uh, uh, um, uh, false judgment have 
have completely uh, taken over sections of the media about the Pope. And the, the <coughs> tragedy of the moment is that we can't hear the Pope uh, witness to us about the things that are going to bring us peace. We can't hear the Pope. We can't hear John Donne. We can't hear the, the people that could give us life. So we, they, they poisoned the, <coughs> poison the well. They poisoned the well, and they've done it <coughs> accidentally. They've often poisoned it on, on, the, on the very basis of trying to save the well. But that, that's what happens. That's what happens, like, like the story of Moby Dick, where, where Captain Ahab dives after the white whale. Uh, uh, but destroys himself and the ship in diving after the white whale. Or that story in uh, um, not The Man for All Seasons, that play, where, where <laughs> Thomas More is talking to Richard, and Richard says, I would cut down every law in the realm of England to get the devil. And what does Thomas More say to him? Why, Richard, what will happen it, now that you're alone and you don't have any laws to protect you and it's you and the devil who's going to win. Well, it's the same kind of thing. Americans are going, I want revolution against the Pope. I want revolution. I mean, in, in their hearts, they're saying it in different <coughs> ways. And, and it's like, wait a second, people. Well, isn't, that Tom, you don't, isn't that Thomas Paine speaking it, through him? In a way, yeah. In a way, yeah. And so what we have to do is back down uh, g get our senses about us again and, in, and beg God for wisdom and ask for the kind of wisdom that John Donne was talking about of passing over. This is, this is the only wisdom that's going to help us here. And, and, and in order to help us on a, on, a, on a more practical way, we have the First Amendment. You and know, the, the remedy to speech you don't like? More speech. You know, you know what this is like? It's, what? it's probably a bad example, but <clears throat> I have this bad toe, so I have to go, you know, and I'm on Medicare, so I can go to these doctors. Normally, I would never have the luxury. Well, I've had to go to five doctors. Well, the first four were wrong. Okay? Wrong advice. In other words, you've got to have patience to get the right wisdom. See, the right wisdom may not be revolution okay you go that's an option and you go nah, maybe I shouldn't go that one <laughs> okay you know let's try this one okay <laughs> and maybe you need to slow down and get five counselors because right. because the four may have like it says in the book of Sirach be careful who you get a counsel from right because they all have a motive right See, be, yeah. so the one advising you for revolution you think he has your interest in mind um, he might or he might not. He might be very sincere, but there's a famous movie in the 70s. I don't remember the movie, but I remember the quote. Revolution is the opiate of the intellectuals. In other words, intellectuals love revolution. It's an opiate for them. That, that I think, is really an interesting insight. And I was told that in Madison, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. by, by a friend when we visited there in 1971. So I remember that, that, that revolution was in the air, like Bob Dylan says. Revolution was in the air in 1971 in it's Madison, still Wisconsin. It's still in the air. Okay, but the point about that is, hey, step back, contemplate, pass over, listen, step back into yourself, ask for wisdom. Move on wisdom. Listen to people like Archbishop Odama and, and try to quiet the voice of Thomas Paine a little bit. That's what I'm trying to do, personally. Like I said, you know. And, and as far as the Pope goes, I want to give a challenge to uh, people. If they really if they want to dialogue with me, I'm open to it. Uh, email me. Uh, I'm going to give my email at the end of this program. You can email me, and we'll talk about the church. And I especially want to reach out to people who have given up on the church or have given up on Christianity. I want to challenge you again uh, to, to see how, uh, what, a, uh, what a wonderful thing Christianity is. Well, why do you think people are giving up on Christianity? I mean, you can see the Pope because, you know, the, what's happening there. But why would they give up on Christianity? 
Well, for me, in, uh, in times like this, it, well, because there, there's just so much confusion in the air, and we do live in an environment of, uh, of revolt uh, at, uh, in lots of different ways, and we do live in a time when people have hardened into their own ideologies. And I also like the quote from uh, the musician John Meyer uh, when they own the information, they can bend it all they want, right? When they own the information, they can bend it all they want. And, and uh, uh, we're waiting for the world to change. There's a whole bunch of millennials out there that are, are just upset with the conditions that they've been, that they've been thrown into, thrownness, like uh, Heidegger talks about. And they, they want a way out, but they don't know how to relate our way of talking about Christianity with their experience yet, and we got to build bridges to them. And I think that's a big, big issue. We have to pass over more to these brothers and sisters who, and I want to do that. So email me uh, and challenge me and tell me why you're leaving the church and tell me why you're leaving Jesus. Yeah, makes sense. Um, <clears throat> this is the end of the show here. Right. Uh, this is Citizens for Community Media. And Gus is in our community, and you know a lot of people. And mm -hmm. hopefully, uh, you know, this gets a little discussion going. Right. That's what, in other words, what we need. Instead we, of just, just discussing how great Notre Dame's doing in football. Well, I'm very happy about them doing well in football. <laughs> right. But like you said, there might be more important things. So uh, this is uh, Gus Zilke and Peter Helland on Citizens for Community.